movement here in the Twin Cities. Yes. Every single one of us has marched behind this guy, chanted with this guy, and followed his lead throughout the streets of Minneapolis and St. Paul. I don't happen to know you yet. I look forward to meeting you today, and I'm glad you're here. Um, Sabra and I have known each other through the anti-war committee for several years now. Jeff and I, since before I had a baby, so more than 10. Yeah, 13 years, um, which is how long that this guy and I have been doing important work here in the Twin Cities, and it's an honor to work with Sabri. Um, we're actually learning today because with us we also have Sabri's so oldest daughter, who's a little shy, and his wife, Branca, who made us amazing sweets. So, if you were shy before the event about grabbing a bite to eat, I think she made enough for everyone to have some. So feel free to grab a snack at the end and thank you Rhonda for doing that. Um, we also are in a space today that's donated by Basim Sabri, who is the father of one of our committee members, and we're very lucky to have this space. We're sharing it with a wedding, which is another important event. I think it's a wedding. It's happening in the building. But I think there's room for all of us here. And luckily for you guys, Sabri and I both have very big voices. So I don't think you'll miss anything. Um, I wanted to let people know, um, it's a little hard to find your way around. There are bathrooms in the building down on the first floor. If you go down the stairs, but out through the cafe, it's right across the hall from the cafe. Um, if you're, if you need to go in the middle of the event, you can't find it. I think there'll be AWC people near the doors to help you find your way. That said, I'm really glad you all found your way here today. And I think the last thing, yep, what? We're going to do announcements after a speech, if that's okay. If you want, uh, if you want, if you for some reason have to leave before you're ready to make it, you can give it to me. I'll make sure it's me. Um, the other thing we're going to do at the end is we have a number of ways to concretely get involved to continue working for Palestine. We're going to have a speaker from the U.S. Palestinian Community Network, Matter Alrai. We're going to have one of the folks organizing Rock for Us in a few weeks. Carmel Sabri is going to be speaking. But those are just brief because mostly we're here to hear from Sabri, hear his stories, see his pictures, and ask him all of our burning questions. So without further ado, let's hear it for Sabri Wazwa. <laughs> So sorry, but so before I begin, and I'll explain later, I need a raise of hands. Who are devout Christians here? And I'll, I'll get to the point during my who's a Christian here. Okay, ladies, raise your hands. Ladies, raise your hands. I'll get to the point when I get to my All ladies, okay. Okay. Later, as I speak, I'll make points and make you understand why I ask a Christian. First of all, my name is Sabri Wadwa. I'm a Palestinian. I was born here in the U.S. in Chicago. I moved to Minnesota when I was 15. I've lived in the U.S. my whole life, so I consider myself an American Palestinian. I don't even know how to read or write Arabic, so I'm more American than I am even Palestinian. I began my activism when I was in high school for the, Afri for the justice for African Americans, and only when I went to Palestine in 1998, which I also got married that year, that's when I started getting more involved in Palestine, when I witnessed the racism and apartheid with my own eyes. Everything I'm about to tell you is going to be backed up by my documentary, where you're going to see with your own eyes in the video. So everything in my documentary is going to be 100% uh, uh, evidence uh, covered, no lies. I, I, I go by uh, what I see, I record the truth, and I'm against violence of any side. So you'll never hear me just side with one people. If I see violence on any side, I'm gonna condemn both sides. My whole point of my documentary is, as a Palestinian, I am sick and tired of always just seeing one side reported on the American media. Uh, it's, like, it's like, how would you feel if every single time something happened, you only hear the other side, you don't hear both sides. You're gonna get frustrated. So it's about time that you guys hear the sides coming from the one that you never hear about what happens to the Palestinians on an everyday basis and what really happens. I left December 15, uh, I arrived at 2.20 a.m. 
into the Israeli airport in Ben Gurion in Tel Aviv at 2.20 a.m. Wednesday, December 17th. Now, before I arrived there, there was betting going on between my family, and I'm not making this up, there was betting going on if Sabri is going to be allowed or not. I'm a pacifist, I'm non-violent, I don't believe in violence whatsoever, and yet every single person was betting. Why? Just because of my criticism of Israel on social media. But the thing that the thing that made me laugh is if Israel is such a democracy, why would they have a problem of me criticizing them on social media if all I'm doing is exposing their racist apartheid laws? I've never once preached violence towards Israelis. I never once preached violence wishing any hatred or any death or any violence towards Jews. Everything I put on social media, and those who follow me, you see for yourself, it's only about expecting fair laws for both people. I condemn all the Muslim governments that have the same racist policies all the time on social media. Yet there was betting going on between my family that I might not be allowed just because I criticized Israel on social media. As soon as I arrived there, they looked at my passport, asked where my parents born. I said they were born here. They merely sent me in a room, and as I sat in the room, I was sitting and sitting and sitting. After an hour, finally a lady comes and she says, we would like to talk to you. I said, no problem. I went and sat in the room. She's like, I just got to make sure I find your mom and your dad in a computer database because you said they were born here and we'll let you on your way. I said, no problem. After about 90 minutes with her, uh, she finished. She sent me back to this room. I'm the only one sitting in this room. It's been about four hours now, still sitting here, getting bored out of my mind, wondering why I'm being detained like this. I finally call over a supervisor and ask him, excuse me, I'm an American. And I've been here now for four hours, nobody's telling me why they won't let me in. It's not like I've never been here before. I've been here in 1998, three separate times. I even got married here. Why am I being treated like I'm a terrorist or something? How as long is it going to take for you guys to do a security check and let me on my way? He said, oh no, this is just a typical security check. I said, well, last time I checked, I don't see anybody else in this room but me. <laughs> Sitting about, right about five hours, this young German, German kid comes in, he's about 20 years old. Turns out he was being held from the same plane as I was, but he was being interrogated in a different room for five hours straight. Why was he interrogated? Because his email name was suspicious. His email name had a name that was an Afghani name. So they wanted to know why a German had an Afghani name for an email, and he was also detained. He was only like 21 years old. So he was brought in, in the room, after he was interrogated, and we're both sitting here. About 15 minutes after that, this homeless woman comes in, or she said she was homeless. She sits by us, she's hungry. I asked the supervisor, I asked you an hour ago, where's my food? He finally quickly brings me a sandwich and water. So I give it to the ladies, I felt bad for her. She's homeless, she, they wouldn't even bring her food. And then all the people that work there are giving me bad looks, like, hey, you've been begging us for me to eat, why are you giving it to her? I'm like, I thought you are a democracy. You're upset because I gave a homeless woman something to eat instead of bringing her food to your own? Anyways, as time going by, it's getting frustrating. I got two cousins waiting outside, waiting to pick me up in the airport. Finally, after eight hours, I called my cousin. I'm like, look, it might be forever. I don't know how long it's going to take. You guys might as well leave. I'll catch a taxi when they let me in. About eight and a half hours now, I finally call over a supervisor. And I'm like, excuse me. Look, I'm not trying to be mean, man, but I'm an American. Okay, I have no violence in my record. I don't understand why I'm being held and treated like a terrorist. You guys keep saying it's a security check. I mean, how long does it take for, for a country like Israel that has all the weapons and the military from the U.S.? How long does it take for you guys to do a security check on me? I mean, I'm not a violent person. I mean, if I did, you would have seen any kind of my record. Anyways, finally after nine and a half hours, they come and call me. They're like, we're going to take you to immigration. It's their decision. I go into immigration. I sit down, and I'm talking to the immigration lady. Keep in mind, it's her decision if they let me in or not. So I sit with her and she looks at me and she's like, I'm going to be honest with you. Our security thinks that you're going to cause us problems. I'm like, well, how am I going to cause you problems? I don't know, they feel like you're going to cause problems for the army. I'm like, man, I'm not trying to be funny here. Open my laptop, okay? Go through my music playlist. Pick on anyone. Let's say Elton John. You think I'm making this up and I just put him in there? Pick on any one of his songs and I'll sing the lyrics. Do you know a terrorist that knows every single lyric of Elton John? And I'm not trying to be funny. I really told him this. And the 
Asian lady looked at me and she's like, I'd be honest with you, the security says they don't want you in here. I'm like, why? I don't get it. They feel like you're going to cause our army problem because I criticize you on social media, but that's what a democracy is about. If you have nothing to hide, why are you scared if I criticize you on social media? I criticize Saudi Arabia, I criticize Jordan, I criticize Egypt, I criticize all the Muslim government. That's what a democracy is about, right? I don't preach anything violent. I'm pretty sure that's why I've been sitting here nine hours. You guys have been looking at my social media, but you couldn't find anything about me preaching violence because I don't believe in violence. I'm just criticizing racist policies. I guarantee you, you're not going to get any problems from me. And then she finally says, you know what? I love Elton John too. I trust you. I got my visa lot. Ten hours, five minutes. Ten hours, five minutes. An American. Okay? That's how they treat an American. And each time I tell them I'm an American, you treat me like a terrorist, their response is we don't give a damn about America, we don't give a damn about anybody. So remember, this is that our taxpayers is what's given them the aid and the weapons, and this is how they talk. So I want to just give you an idea of how the so-called democracy, how they begin, holding you 10 hours because you criticize them on social media. Now, a lot of the things that I want to cover, uh, which I'm covering in my documentary, the apartheid wall, military checkpoints, the racist laws, how there's laws just for Jews, and then there's different laws for Christians and Muslims. Housing, home demolitions, the settler violence, which you'll never, ever, ever hear about on American media. The skunk trucks, uh, breaking the lies. The number one myth, the number one lie in America is that Israel protects the Christians. The biggest joke of all time, okay? So I have pictures, but the video will be in the documentary. You will hear uh, interviews and you will hear from your own ears one of the biggest prominent public figure for Christianity himself, Atala speaking, talking about how they are second class citizens, how, how the wall is taking their land, how they stole out of their land, how settlers go to churches and spray paint graffiti on the side of the churches, evil, gruesome things towards Christians, but nothing happening to the settlers because they're always protected. You will hear it from yourself. Israel does not protect the Christians. In fact, a lot of Christianity has been lost. A lot of the Christianity has been removed from the Holy Land because their lives are living hell and a lot of Christians got fed up from being second class citizens and they left the Holy Land. Separate roads, refugee camps, separate IDs, different entrances for Jews and Palestinians for services like going to a place to renew your passport, getting your ID, your driver license, getting uh, insurance, stuff. There's separate entrances for Jews only, and then there's different entrances where you have to wait outdoors if you're Christians and Muslims. So I'm going to go ahead and begin with the apartheid wall. The apartheid wall, the majority of it is 25 feet high. The Berlin Wall was only 10 feet high. Um, just to give you an idea of how long the apartheid wall is, it goes from Chicago, excuse me, from Minneapolis to Gary, Indiana. It's like 480 miles long. Now keep in mind, the, the, the Israel, the entire Israel, meaning Israel and the West Bank, guys, all of it, is slightly smaller than the state of New Jersey. So for it to go ahead and be 480 miles long, the apartheid wall has to literally cut through, zigzag all throughout, and they made sure all of the 480 miles of this wall is only built on Palestinian land. And remember, when I say Palestinian, this is why I asked earlier, raise your hands if you're Christian. Don't keep confusing between an Arab and a religion. Palestinian means a people. Christianity, Islam, Judaism, that's a religion. A lot of Americans, in fact, if I go right now outside, I bet 8 out of 10 Americans think Palestinian means Muslim Arabs. There are Christian Palestinians also. This wall is not only taking Muslims' land, it's taking Christians' land. It's taking a lot of Christianity and it's dividing it. Why is it important for me to let you guys know that? Because the American media makes you, the majority of the American people, think that all this is done and everything is left alone and the Christians are protected. That is a lie. That is a lie. My documentary should be done if you want and you'll hear it from the Christian mouths of yourselves. Continuing over, I want to talk about the military checkpoints. Imagine knowing that when you get to a military checkpoint, you got these Israeli soldiers with four-foot machine guns hanging from their neck. And I'm not going to lie, I told you guys earlier, I will never ever go ahead and just criticize one side and say both sides. There are some Israeli soldiers that do their job, 
they said, well, check your ID, and they let you go on your way. And each time somebody was cool, cool with me like that, I told them, thank you for treating me like a human being, and I left. But the problem is, majority of the Israeli soldiers treat you like you're a dog, an animal. Actually, I can't say dog, because we treat dogs. They treat you like you're an animal. They treat you like you're, you're, like you're nothing. It's gone. They purposely try to have you start an argument with them, hoping they can take the gun, hit you upside your head, maybe try to go ahead and put it in your head. That's the problem. They like to purposely instigate with you. They take the question and they repeat that same question over and over and over again. One time I was on a bus, and when you get to a checkpoint and you're on a bus, the first thing they do is they come up, two of them, one stands in the front of the bus, and one walks through and they check the ID. Like I said, it's a nice Israeli soldier, it's kind of the Because it's a really cool Israeli soldier who thinks he's full of himself because he has a big machine gun on He starts asking him, wait, he starts yelling at the ladies, they don't care. Majority of them don't care. When they, see, when they see somebody and he has a bag with them, they immediately call him off the bus. So one time he sees me, he sees my camera bag, called me off the bus. I went off the bus and he starts saying, uh, what's in there? I'm like, the camera. Why don't I just make it easy to open it? I opened it, I showed him everything. There was a guy and a lady. Turns out the lady soldier was from Memphis. So she was kind. She was kind to me and she even got fed off with the guy because he kept repeating and asking the same questions. So finally, after he asked what's in the bag, and I just showed him again, she got fed up, and she started talking to him in English. And I noticed she's talking to him in Hebrew, and then she apologized to me for the way he was talking to me because I really I started losing my temper with him. Because he, they start asking the same question over and over and over again. So it's like they, they try to cause problems on purpose. Um, one of the military checkpoints is in a city called Kalendia, which is a refugee camp. It's right between the city of Ramallah and Jerusalem. Between Ramallah and Jerusalem, it's only 10 miles. That's the worst military checkpoint in all of Palestine. If you get through that military checkpoint in 45 minutes, you're having a good day. Sometimes it takes two to four hours. So if you live in Ramallah, that's the West Bank, and you have a permit to go say pray in the Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem, you are lucky if you get through 45 minutes. That's just a checkpoint. That's not to get to inside Jerusalem. It usually will take two to four hours to get somewhere 10 miles, but just that checkpoint. They have four lanes, but 90% of the time they keep the lanes closed and keep one. They have four lanes, but they keep it only for one, so there could be thousands of cars, make life a living hell for the Palestinians. Make it as hard as possible to get to that military checkpoint. So imagine if you lived, say, in Brooklyn Park, and you wanted to go to Minneapolis, okay? Let's say, I asked earlier who was the woman. All you ladies out there, how would you feel if every day you're driving from Brooklyn Park to Minneapolis, you're going to this military checkpoint, yet only it's for women, it's only for ladies. Anybody else, men, are allowed to have a separate road, because that's how it is. Jews have a separate road, no military checkpoint. But if you're Palestinian, Christian or Muslim, you have to go to a military checkpoint coming out of the West Bank. So how would you ladies feel? Ask yourself that question. That's the only way you're really going to feel how a Palestinian feels is how are you, how are you going to feel? If it's just for you. And then I want to go ahead and talk about home demolitions. If you're Palestinian and you commit a crime, it doesn't matter if you don't own the house. My friend Lyle over there. If you commit a crime and you're Palestinian, it doesn't matter if your dad owns the house. That house is gone. It's demolished. If you're Jewish and you commit a crime, you could be the father himself and you own that home. Nothing happened to the home. Even if you murder, even if you murder people, nothing happens to you if you're, if you're Jewish. But if you're Christian or Muslim and your kid commits a crime, your home is demolished. And keep in mind, homes over there aren't like homes in the U.S. They're made out of concrete, pure concrete and rock. They last seven, eight, nine hundred years. Some of the homes that I see, 1,200 years, nothing happens to them. They're pure concrete rock that they have a special place over in that area for the ground. Imagine knowing your kid committed a crime, they're going to come and demolish your home. But if a Jewish person comes and, say, kills your child, nothing happens to their home. That's what apartheid is. Palestinians are not saying that they want special laws, just the same laws. That's all they're saying. Just everybody should have the same laws. The Palestinian Authority there, most of the Palestinians don't even like the Palestinians. They are happy with having the same laws. They don't mind living, which you will see in my documentary. The myth of Palestinians, if they see Jews, they're going to attack them. Well, it's going to be in the documentary. 
Palestinians and Jews live side by side in Jerusalem. They live side by side in Tel Aviv and Yaffa. They go together in the same coffee shop. They're sitting together in the same restaurant. They walk by each other. I know, I didn't only see it, I documented it. They walk in tight, closed spaces. Walking over to the Aqsa Mosque, you see Americans, tourists, Europeans, Palestinians, by the thousands, Jews, nobody attacking anybody. But the American media doesn't want you to see this because they want you to go ahead and think if either one sees each other, they're just going to attack each other. And that's why Israel has the military checkpoints, that's why it has the apartheid laws. But that's a lie. That's a lie because if that's the case, then anywhere Palestinians and Jews are near each other or live with each other or sit in the same restaurant with each other, that means they should be attacking each other, right? Well, that's a lie because millions are conversing and living together and shopping together. But the only reason they want to keep this apartheid wall and the racism in place is because they want Palestinians, Christians and Muslims to be fed up and sick and tired of being treated this way because some people are fed up. Some people don't, can't take it. Not everybody was a Martin Luther King and Malcolm X during the civil rights movement. Some of them just, just didn't care, they gave up. A lot of Palestinians gave up and they left because they can't deal with it anymore. Some of them are just can't fed up. If you're Jewish, you lived in Russia or Europe or China or wherever, doesn't matter if you've never ever stepped foot in Israel. You go there, you immediately get full citizenship, that's it. You're automatically full citizenship, they even pay you money to live there. And you have rights and privileges. You could be nine years old Palestinian, you've lived there your whole life, you were born there. Yet, you have a separate ID. They even put the religion on your ID. That's a part of it. They make sure that you go ahead and say Muslim or Christian. They give you a separate ID, they give you a separate driver's license. They make it hard for you to go ahead and buy a home. If you live inside Jerusalem, or the northern part of Israel, and you don't live in the West Bank, and say you got married to somebody in the West Bank, you cannot go ahead and bring them over and have papers. Let's say you're a lady and you married a guy from the West Bank. You cannot bring them over. They will never give you an idea. But if you're Jewish, you could go ahead and marry anybody you want. You don't even have to apply. Because if you live anywhere, you get to maneuver wherever you want. You can live in the Khali or wherever you want. You can live in the Africa wherever you want. If you're a Palestinian, you live in the West Bank, doesn't matter you were born there, you lived there all your life. Doesn't matter your great, 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 great grandfather lived on that land. You're only confined to the West Bank. That's it. You can't go anywhere else. That's apartheid. How would you like it if all of a sudden Canadians came and came to America and they made it where nobody who's American could leave Minnesota? Canadians could go wherever they want. Minnesotans have to stay just in Minnesota. They can, I mean, Americans cannot leave America. How would you guys feel? There is no but. There is no ah, uh, but. How would you feel? Ask yourself that question. If all of a sudden Canadians came and took, you have to understand, you cannot make an excuse for racism. What happened to the Jews in the Holocaust was horrifying. It was, it was like one of the biggest tragedies, but here's the problem though. What happened to them in Europe was by Nazis who were also Christian, and yet, they're going to use that as an excuse to go ahead and have them just come over. There was Jews already living there. But that doesn't mean you take all of them and you bring them to a place where people already live in and then say, okay, we just got massacred, so we're going to massacre you. And then in their, in their schools, they, they, they hide everything. In the U.S., at least now in the U.S., in the schools, they talk about what they did. They admit what they did in the slave trade. They admit what they did to the Native Americans. They admit what they did to, to, to the tragedy. In Israel, they don't tell people that at school. They don't tell people about Deir Yassin, a small town where every single person was there was massacred by settlers. They don't tell people about that. 750,000 Palestinians immediately become refugees. They hide that. They're not at least willing to admit we did this and okay, we didn't want to make up for it. They're not. They deny everything. All the wrongdoing, they deny. Separate IDs I told you about. If you're Muslim, you have an ID to say if you're Muslim or Christian. But if you're Jewish, you have an ID and it gives you special privileges. Um, entrances, if you go through your passport, your ID, driver's license, whatever. It, the, the myth about the, don't think the Middle East, it's warm all year. Okay? I, I, I thought that first when I went there too. Not all the Middle East, it's like, remember, it's like America. Not every, everywhere, like we know Minnesota ain't like Florida. It gets cold there. So when they stand in line for passports and so on and IDs and all that, they have to stand outside. So sometimes you got 300 people in line to go in a building to so do their passport. So they can go ahead and apply for insurance and so on. But for Jews, they have a separate entrance and they're waiting inside. So, I mean, how would you guys feel? I mean, today, we're talking about 2015, the ones like us who are not 
not the type who still want racism. How would you feel? Me, as a person, I would not appreciate it if I was standing indoors and I know, say, my African American friends, okay, were standing outside because let's say that's that's how it still was there. How are you going to feel? Is that right? Does, that doesn't make any sense. Talking about uh, stunt trucks, which Jess knows about. Um, there were some Palestinian children in a certain area, and they were throwing stones, rocks, Israeli soldiers. They have this truck. <coughs> Imagine the smell of sewer water, okay? Now times it by a thousand. They take this stunt truck, they go to that neighborhood. They have no idea where these kids live, but they will go ahead and blame it on the whole neighborhood. And it's on video, it'll be in the documentary. The stunt truck will pass by an entire block, two blocks sometimes, and aim for windows of every single apartment and spray that, making sure every single home and apartment is hit. This smell is so terrible. I didn't believe my cousin before I went there. It will stay for one week, even if you wash yourself with bleach every single day, the smell will not go for one week. Because it's not even sewer water. It turns out they chemically engineered it to smell absolutely horrible. That's like saying all of a sudden you see somebody in the neighborhood did something wrong. The US police is gonna come and they're gonna spray paint, excuse me, spray the entire block neighborhood. Now, Raise your hand if you think that you'll be all right. <laughs> Raise your hand if you think you're all right with even knowing something happened to your child. I have four kids, that's one of them I did. Let's say something happened to one of your kids. How would you feel knowing that if somebody did something to your kid, even though his father did not know what happened, what his son did, his home for hundreds of years demolished. Raise your hand if you think you're, you're if somebody did something to my kid, I wouldn't want that person's dad that had nothing to do with his kid demolished. And if you're Palestinian, Christian, Muslim, that's what happens. Your home's demolished. If you're Jewish, nothing. Muhammad Abu Khdir, we keep seeing about non-stop reaction about what happened to the Jordanian pilot. Well, there's, you know what's worse than burning a human being alive? There is one thing worse. Burning a human being, a child alive, and before even burning him, keep in mind, those were extremists. We all agree that ISIS are sick extremists. By settlers, burning, uh, excuse me, pouring gasoline down his throat before even burning him alive. And then when they burned him alive, the Israeli government did not even go after them. They tried to put out a story saying his own family killed Muhammad Abu Khdir because they found out that he might be gay. It had to take the father, and I have this footage, the father had to go beg somebody to show him his camera footage outside the shop. He had to tape it on his own phone if it wasn't for him saving it, Israel, the government, went to that store and deleted his hard drive. It had to show the news, that video showing the Israeli settlers kidnapping his son, only for the Israeli government to finally go and arrest those people. They tried to hide it. They tried to hide the fact. Why? Because they have this belief, anything a Jewish person does, that nothing, nothing is above it. He is above the law and everything. And I'm talking about the Israeli government. I'm not talking about all Jews, because you will see that in my documentary. You will see pictures of rabbis, part of the Notre Dame rabbis, Jewish rabbis, Jewish religious leaders, plaques under doors that says, Jew, not a Zionist, that stand with us. And I know there's Jews in this audience that stand with Palestinians. You don't have to go ahead and be anti-Semitic to stand against the government of Israel. I'm a Muslim. I stand against uh, Muslim extremism. Why? Because it's common sense. Nobody is condemning Jewish people. We're condemning the government of Israel. There are thousands of Jews with us. There are thousands of Jews in Israel that stand against the government of Israel, that protest against them, that condemn what they're doing. And they're also beaten. I have pics showing you. They're also beaten. They're beaten by the Israeli government if they simply go ahead and say, we got to stop occupying the Palestinians. There's thousands of Israeli soldiers. Go to Facebook, go to their page, break into silence. Soldiers, Israeli soldiers, don't believe anything I'm saying. Their own words that the Israeli government, their superiors used to tell them, treat these people like animals. And they couldn't take it anymore. They refused. They were even jailed because they said, we can't occupy people, it's wrong. 
One Israeli soldier didn't know I had my camera on. As soon as I approach one, the first thing they do, they say, if your camera's on, we will break it. So I make sure my camera's off. One time I took a chance. I left my camera on and I approached an Israeli soldier. I was in a really, really like sour mood that day because I just interviewed an elementary school and you hear little girls talking about how they're constantly attacked by, by Jewish settlers. They're constantly attacked with stones walking to school. They simply want to go to school and they're attacked. So I was in a sour mood. I wanted to know why the Israeli soldiers just stand there while the Israeli settlers throw stones at Palestinian girls. Because here, we always see on the news about Palestinians throwing stones in the media. Why don't they ever show that Israeli settlers are also throwing stones? Not just throwing stones at little Palestinian girls just trying to go to school. I walk up to the Israeli soldier. Again, you'll see in the documentary. So don't just, don't take my word for it. I'll prove everything I say. He doesn't know the camera's on. I'm like, listen, I'm against both sides throwing stones. I'm against violence. But I just need to know why you soldiers stand there. And you guys shoot live ammunition at Palestinian kids for rocks. Live ammunition. Yet when, 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 when Israeli settlers throw stones, you guys are literally standing by them and not even telling them stop. And he admitted on camera, saying, look, I'm not going to lie, there are Jewish soldiers because they feel they're Jewish, and the ones settlers are Jewish, they don't do nothing about it, and I admit it's wrong. But if I see it, I stop it. And he continues by saying, just a couple weeks ago, they were doing it, throwing at rock. And I told him, really? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, well, look, we just got to at least acknowledge that both, look, anybody that doesn't be violent is wrong. But just treat both the same. I mean, I guarantee you there will, there will be less Palestine protests if you treat both the same. And he said, oh, I will. I promise you everything. I have this on camera. It will be in the documentary. I ain't making this stuff up. They shoot live ammunition at Palestinian children for throwing rocks, but they stand. They stand right by the Israeli settlers throwing the rocks. How would you feel knowing that somebody's throwing rocks at you, there's a police officer standing right by him, nothing happens. But if your kid threw a rock, the same police shot live ammunition out. It's just, 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 don't be afraid. Raise your hand if you think that's fair. It's common sense, right? But the problem is the American media. The American media is not showing it. That's the problem. The American media won't show these things. Refugee camps. Some of my family, some of my wife's family live in refugee camps. You know how sad it is? And I always tell them that when I go there. A lot of them when I'm there, especially my cousins, some of the places I went to interview, the first thing they did when, when I told them I'm going here and here, they looked at me like I was crazy. They told me, man, you can't go there. That's a, that's a, that's a area where only the really crazy settlers live. They'll attack you. But I didn't care. I see a people suffering. They did, what am I, what's the worst that can happen? I'm going to shoot and die? Am I going to miss my family and friends? Of course. But you have to understand. I mean, all I want is for people to know the truth what's going on. That's it. That's all. I don't want them to go ahead and think that if I see a Palestinian commit a crime, um, of course not. First thing I'm going to say, punish that person. All I'm saying is if the other side also does a crime, punish the person. That's all I'm saying. You know, hard is knowing that because I have a U.S. passport, I have more privilege, privileges when I walk around there than my, my sister, my brother-in-law, my one of my cousins, my aunt, my aunt who's like almost seven years old. I have more privileges than her. I could go to Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem and pray. I could go to Yaffa and Hefa, but my aunt who's seven years old, who was born and lived her whole life, she's confined to the West Bank. Why should an effing American passport give me more privileges than my aunt who's lived there her whole life? My great, great, great grandfathers were there. We're not magicians. We didn't just appear. They say that they came to a land without people. I'm like, if that's the case, then how are all these Palestinians there? Because Israel's making it hard, as, as hard as possible to go there. Where did they come from? They sure held it and let them in. If you're Jewish, you don't have no time limit to renew your passport. If you're a Palestinian, you have one year to renew your passport. They purposely do it like that. Why? Because if you don't come back within a year, they say, oh, sorry, you lost your right. Because there's two IDs. And that ID, there's the Diffit, West Bank, and there's the ID called the Uts, meaning Jerusalem. If you have the Jerusalem ID, that means you get to go wherever you want. Yaffa, Haifa, West Bank, wherever you want. And Palestinians are clinging on to their lives with that. They make it as hard as possible for you to go ahead and stay there. They want your life a living hell. If you lose your ID, your, diff, your excuse me, your, uh, your Uts, your Jerusalem ID, the only way you get it back is if you get a lawyer, 
and you have to make sure you find a really good Jewish lawyer because he have, you have to find one of those that is against Zionism. And he stands with you. You've got a lot of money because it takes a lot of work. And you've got to stay there for several years to get it back. You can't go and come here, please. Why? They don't want a Palestinian having an ID and say he wants to go to live in Europe and he has a better job and make a better living. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not allowed. Jews could go and come as they go. Palestinian Christian Muslims can act. And then ask yourself, why do you never ever see in American media all the protests uh, by, the, by the racist Israelis towards the African Americans? I have the footage, you're gonna see it in my documentary. Ask yourself, because a smart person asks himself, why is it that I've never seen on American media? Chanting to people who are also Jewish. They're so racist that they're against even their own kind because they're black. Telling them the N-word. And go home, and your mom's a whore. You ends, go back to Africa. To, to say that the fellow Jews, just because they're black, because of the color of skin. Not saying all of them are, but the Zionists, the, the racist ones, they're the ones that are doing it. But you, you never see these, never see these on uh, American media. Never see this footage. They never showed you the protest. When they were chanting, when Gaza was being bombed, when they were chanting death to all Arabs. And they were laughing and chanting, we killed their kids. If it's about Hamas, then why would you chant, we killed their kids? I don't care if it's Netanyahu's own child, I would not let anything happen to that child. You chant on the street in the thousands, we killed their kids, jumping and laughing. Yet Fox News never played that. They fight, they vilify, they make the Palestinians look like they're these terrorists because they're old. Show the same image. They don't show you the images of Palestinians going to, the, uh, to Jericho, sitting in nice restaurants, going over to restaurants in the mall, just trying to get a, go to a nice restaurant, sit down, enjoy themselves. They play paintball. They go bowling like we do. Even, even things that I didn't know. I didn't even know there was paintball in Palestine. They have paintball. <laughs> they go bowling. In Bethlehem, there's a bowling lane now. They do typical things just like we do. They do. But you have to understand, the people that go ahead and sometimes lose it is because they cannot take living under occupation over and over and over. One time we had a protest in front of Coleman's office, former Senator Coleman's office, at University. I don't know if you remember, 2004 in the summer. Busiest, one of the busiest streets in St. Paul. We shut it down. People yeah. laid down yeah. on the streets. One of my friends, Jerry, remember Jerry? Laid down. So keep in mind, the whole street, University, picture University Avenue, okay? By the U of M, right by 280 and uh, 94. We shut it down, both sides. We're talking about long way. Semi comes up, he's in the front. He comes up and he tells my friend Jared, if you don't move, I'm driving over, I don't care. He couldn't stand five minutes of occupation. This guy was ready to drive home with my friend. Imagine 66 years of occupation. Imagine 66 years of Imagine 66 years. I mean, all we want is just justice. That's it. That's all we want. You have to understand, people cannot take, do you know every single time there was an attack, some, some extremist went ahead and, and, and lost it and he committed an attack? Do you know 99.9999% of those who did that were from the West Bank? So what does that tell you? There's over 1.5 million Palestinians living outside the West Bank. Why don't any of them lose it? They're just as religious. Because it's harder. It's when, you, when you don't live occupied, it's easier. Even though you still have separate laws and you still live under apartheid, it's different when you live under occupation as well. Why, why is it? Nobody, till now, not one human being was able to answer me this question. Why is it 99.999% of every suicide bomber that ever happened was from the West Bank. Why? Why didn't, why didn't, why didn't another 30% come from Jerusalem or Yafra? Why? They're the same, the Palestinians. Why? Why should a 90-year-old in Gaza, and keep in mind, forget about Hamas. Hamas didn't take office till 2007, even before Hamas. Why is it a 90-year-old Palestinian cannot go from Gaza to Al-Aqsa? A lady. Talk about the guy, your favorite, the guy might be a suicide bomber. What about a lady? Nine-year-old lady. I get to go because I have an American passport. I do, but she doesn't. She was born, she lived her own life. Why? Is that fair? Is that right? Is that is that fair? 
During the second intifada, Israeli soldiers marched in the shop. There was two women there. Modesty is taken very seriously in Middle East. They tell this guy, we just seen somebody run in one of these stores. We're looking for a suspect. He told him, I'm right here. I've got customers, not me. He's like 55 years old. They're like, you need to strip right now. He's like, okay, just let the ladies leave. Just to embarrass him, they're like, stay here, ladies. They wouldn't let the ladies leave. Strip right now. He's like, I can't strip in front of the women. He's like, I don't care. The guy's like, I'm not going to strip. You want to shoot me, shoot me. I'm not going to strip. That's how serious modesty is. They shot him dead on the spot. Because he didn't want to strip naked in front of the two ladies. One of those two ladies were your sisters or your, or your, or your mothers. They shot him dead on the spot. Guess what? About a few years later, one of his, one of his sons became a suicide bomb. Some people can't have the same. Maybe I'll do it differently. Maybe I'll just keep doing what I do. A documentary and try to put, bring the word out. Imagine knowing your father got killed because he wouldn't strip naked in front of his customers and he just told them about the money. Why was I held 10 hours and 5 minutes in an airport? I have a, Did you ever hear? Did you have? Do you know any terrorist that knows every single lyric for Elton John? I mean, just, I'm not trying to be funny. I mean, do you guys know of any? I mean, it's, 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 it's ridiculous. They killed their own economy. In Mamilla Avenue, which is a big strip for all Jewish owned stores, Jews themselves told me Israel is killing our economy. Jews are telling me this. Half our customers are Arabs. When they keep doing what they're doing, the Arabs stop coming. They come, they shop, we eat together, we sit in the same espresso shop. But see, the problem is, they, 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 you always hear about, well, this is what's going on, and Hamas and everything. Well, Hamas is only in Gaza. So why are you treating the Palestinians in the Khalil and Ramallah and all these other cities? Why are you treating them like crap? If you say it's about Hamas, why are you treating the Palestinians in northern Israel like crap? Why are you treating the Palestinians in Jerusalem like crap? If it's about Hamas, why? Why is that? Does that make any sense? If it's about Hamas, why are you treating them like crap? It doesn't make any sense. I mean, people just want to go ahead and say enough's enough. Oh, go ahead, I'm going to show you guys some pictures real quick. Kick them out 
of the Jerusalem area, because if you don't live in the Jerusalem area north of there, you lose your ID, which gets to let you travel all throughout of Israel. They want that. They want to keep them out. If you live in the West Bank, in the Khalil, in Dura, in Hanbul, and you're Palestinian, Christian, or Muslim, Bid Lahim, they say they protect the Christians. Bid Lahim is, is 50% Christians. They can't leave Bid Lahim, excuse me, the West Bank. Christians in Bid Lahim can't even go to the Holy Church in Jerusalem. Remember when I asked earlier who's Christian? So how do you feel knowing your fellow Christians can't even leave Bethlehem to go to Jerusalem? How do you feel knowing that? And yet you hear a lie saying that Israel protects the Christians. This home right here, I seen this home on YouTube video. When I got there, I told my cousins, I have to get this home. They told me this home right here is one of the most vile settlements in all of the West Bank. You're risking your life. I told them, listen, I cannot escape it knowing that my people are suffering. If I die, I die. I don't give a damn. I need to get to this home. There's a YouTube video. We don't have sound. So I can't show it to you. It'll be in the documentary. If you go to YouTube, you can see it yourself. Just type Orthodox Jewish woman harasses Palestinian. On YouTube, I seen it a few years ago and I had to come to this home. See these gates here? Right in front of it is settlers. Okay? It used to be all Palestinians. They came, stole some of the Palestinian land, and then they built settlements around it. What a, set, what a settlement means, no one's here settlement. It means it used to be owned to uh, Palestinian. Palestinian Christian Muslim owned that land. Uh, Israel took it by force, built settlements, and the Jews over It's not like they come and say, hey, listen, can I buy from you? Because most of the time, they might say, yeah, can I buy from you? But here's the problem. If you say no, they're going to harass you. They're going to make your life hell. So my cousin says, I could get you there, but it's dangerous. I said, let's go. So we went, and we got to the house that I seen on YouTube. These cages. They had to pay from their own pockets to protect themselves. The Israeli government wouldn't even build it for them. Right across from them. Again, don't take anything I'm saying. Don't believe one word I'm saying. Everything is going to be proved to you on the documentary and this video. Again, go to YouTube, see with your own eyes. You'll see a really racist Jewish woman walking up to the cage, and she be she's just yelling constantly, calling this Palestinian woman. There's might be some kids, so I don't want to say that. Calling her a really bad name in Arabic. And non-stop just harassing her. This Palestinian woman is just standing at home. And she's telling her, get inside your house. She's like, I don't want to get in my house. I can't even stand. She's like, get inside your house. And then you got all these settlers on the streets just non-stop throwing these stones on their home. Which you'll see on a on, 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 on YouTube video or uh, I'll have in the documentary. So I get to this house and I see the cages. And I asked them about the woman. They say, finally Israel removed her from the settlement. Not because they wanted to protect them, because a lot of activists from Europe and other places did the same thing I did. They went, it was creating a stir, it was making Israel look bad. They removed her from the settlement. But here's the problem. Sellers are still throwing stones and rocks at them. They're not being arrested. Soldier stands right here and they're throwing stones at them. And they don't say anything to them. They have to pay from their own pocket just to protect themselves. Their neighbor, which is right in front, literally right from there, the owner of Fifth Street Restaurant, a friend of mine, I didn't even know his sister lived there until, until I got there. Right across from them, right, right past that, literally 100 feet, the owner of Fifth Street Restaurant, he's a good friend of mine, his sister owns a home right across from them. They are not allowed to visit each other. Palestinians cannot visit each other in the settlement. They could call each other that's it. They can't use these paved roads. They have to go from a different entrance on the other side of the house and use a broken down dirt road. So imagine if you have like an 80 year old park. This guy's 80 years old. I get to walk on that paved road. Israeli soldiers stop me, they harass me. In the end, I'm like, listen, I'm playing for right now. You want to shoot me, shoot me. But I, you want to be on CNN shooting in America because he says he wants to be in so be But I'm not leaving. Finally let me go. I get to walk on the paved road. This man cannot. This man's 80 years old. This man's 80 years old. He was born there. He doesn't have the privileges I have because I have an American passport. Like America is this great country. People forgot about what America was built on. And I, and I have more privileges than this man.
Okay, this street right here, I just bought this yesterday. I really suck at technology. And it's a Mac, but it's just the best. Man, I suck at technology. Whoever's really good at technology, man, it's a good field to stay. Stick with it. <laughs> this here, this here is called Shohada Street. Okay? Now, just to give you an idea, a glimpse, how they want to make life hard for Palestinians, just, just wait till you hear this. This street right here takes you from one side of the Khalil, which is a big city in all of Palestine and the West Bank. From here to here, and then once you get down here, another minute, two minutes max. From one side of the Khalil to another side of the Khalil. Two minutes max. The other side of the Khalil, Babazaria, that's the main shopping market area. Okay? What did they do? They came, they closed down all the Palestinian shops, kicked out all the Palestinians, purposely put 400 of the most extremist, racist settlers there, and closed off the road. They, of all the places, they picked this, because this is the only main road, and made it only accessible by Jews only. If you're Christian or Muslim, you cannot drive on that road. And here's the problem. The Khalil is not like, it's not like uh, uh, most of America. Um, you know how like there's places in America that's all roads, and in some places all hills in the country? The Khalil is all hills, like San Francisco. Just by not being able to drive on that road, they have to take a separate road which takes them through the biggest hills of the Khalil because every, everything is home, so it's like confined. There's no other road but this road, to take this road. They have to take 25 to 30 minutes to get to the other side of the market when they'll take two minutes in this road. And they put 400 of the most extremist settlers there. And as soon as I went there, they, I had to, again, harass me. They, I always talk to them just in English. If, I, if they know I know Arabic, they don't care if I have American passport. They will not let me in. I keep telling them I only speak English. And after a while, they finally say, go ahead. So I walked this whole way while my nephew stayed behind. And it was just sad, because these used to be Palestinian shops. They were Palestinian homes. They kicked them out forcefully. They put 400 settlers in the middle amongst 250,000 Palestinians. It's one thing to go ahead and put them on there. But on top of putting them on there to make the road accessible by Jews only, I mean, that's like really extreme. You make Palestinians drive 25 to 30 minutes to go through uphills and battles just to get to the other side? A lot of them have old cars. It ain't that easy to just get a car like it is here. I mean, that's how racist it is. There's no reason for them to deny a Palestinian driving that road. Because I just finished telling you, you will see in the documentary Palestinians in the millions living amongst with the Jews, walking together, sitting in the same espresso shop, sitting in the same restaurants, walking to the Luxa Mosque in these type, Jews walking in between these shops that are only Palestinian. No, nobody attacking them, nobody saying a word to them. Everybody saying shalom, hello, sitcha. So if so so what's the purpose of this? Because Palestinian Jews get along in the other parts of town. It's like they purposely are doing it because they want certain areas to make life a living hell for Palestinians, hoping some of them lose their minds, their temper, and somebody does something, so they can keep... It's like saying, there's a dog, and I'm just gonna keep beating him, and then all of a sudden the dog loses it, and he comes and bites me, and all of a sudden I get the camera, hey, see, he just bit me! That's exactly what Israel's doing. That's exactly what Israel's doing. I mean, it's like, enough's enough, stop lying. Stop with the crap. They hired the, the, the smartest hackers to go on social media and lie about what's going on. If you got nothing to hide, why are you paying people to go on social media and lie? They, 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 they take pictures of rabbis that have Palestinian flags, and they go ahead and make it look like they're holding signs condemning Palestinians. I mean, it's just like enough's enough. lady right here is Hannah Wahaiqa, the sister of my friend, the owner of the restaurant. When you see the documentary, it brings you in tears. She's owned her home since 1955. She's the one who lives right across from that home with that old guy. She's not allowed to go up to his house and sit and just talk to him. She's not. She's an old lady. She can't even use her paper. She cries 
on my video telling me I can't even have a car. Palestinians who live among settlers, a car cannot drive up to their home. A taxi cannot drive up to their home. They have to go down a broken down road and get a car from the down uh, end of the hill. Only Jews could drive cars up to their homes in settlements, even though they were there before the Jews that came from Europe, Russia, whatever. I mean, why should a lady who had owned her home in 59? The settlements that came there were came in 1985. She owned her house since 1959. And she told me, I heard stories, because it turns out she'd been to the US before, about there's a lot of stuff going on and cops are killing the people of color. I said, yes. She's like, how do I show support? I'm like, well, I could make a sign. A long time ago, I used to draw. I make a sign. If you want to hold it, she's like, sure. So she wanted to hold the sign to show the people here, and she's coming to visit in April, that she supports the people of color going what they're going through. Even though they're going through their own battles. She cries on the camera, and she says, all I want is my child to go out without fearing that sellers can attack them. Because if they do get attacked, you can't call. There is no 911. Israeli soldiers are not going to listen to you. If, if you tell them a settler just attacked my kid, they're not going to care. The star David is constantly sprayed on the gate of their door. She's like, I gave up. Why should I wash it? They do it in front of Israeli soldiers. Nothing happened. She got bullet holes outside her house. See, Israeli soldiers don't care. If they, if they want to shoot at a Palestinian kid, they don't care that that Palestinian kid might be in front of somebody's home. They don't care. They don't care if they shoot and kill an old lady. They don't care. They have nothing. They're always protected. Nothing happens to them. area to get into my ship. Now this one, none of my cousins would dare come with me on this one except one. He, he's literally, they, they, they're like, you are really like overdoing your great consultation. I'm, like, I'm, I'm not even trying to be funny. I'm not just the type right now. The biggest thing I laugh at is if some of my family members say something stupid about me. I'm not afraid of I'm not afraid of The great thing is that I'm not a child that lives there. I'm having to go through checkpoints just to walk to school. I'm not afraid. I'm just trying to show the truth. When I get to this area to get to my Sharia, you won't even see regular Jews. You'll only see the, I can't think of the word in English. In Arabic, they're like the Sidnet. They're the really religious ones. You will not see anybody not covered up. You know how that's another myth. See, a lot of things is, is, is just myths here. You guys have no idea that there are Jews that are more religious and dress more modest than the religious Muslims. A lot of times I thought, man, those women got it, those women got it, no, Jews. See, that's the thing a lot of people don't understand. There's a, the person, whether they want to be religious or not, is their preference. But the bottom line is, I don't judge them when I see them if they're religious or not. But every time a Muslim is judged because he might dress too modest. And they're always judged for that. They're always judging, judging the woman if they dress in color. That's her choice if she wants to do that. Anyways, my point of this is, that's where I get to that's my contact. The rabbis who stand with the Palestinians. When, you, when I walk, and I have a bad back, I walk in two and a half hours to get to my shade. When I get there, every single one of them has a plaque, like I told you earlier, that says, Jewish, not a Zionist. This is a rabbi, a religious leader. Why would they have a plaque that says, Jewish, not a Zionist? See, Zionism is a movement. It's the same thing as, 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 as the, the, the Islamist extremists. So I want people to know that just like as a Muslim and millions of us are standing up against extremist uh, uh, Islam, well, we need more and more people to stand up to extremist Jews. Zionists are extremist Jews or non-Jews that anybody that believes in Zionism is an extremist because that's what it is. It's an extreme movement. Why would religious leaders put on their, why would they have Palestinian flags? And again, don't believe one word I'm saying about it. It's going to be the documentary. And by the way, this documentary is simply to wake people up to what's going on in Palestine. I'm not selling it. 
I'm not making one penny on it. Every single thing is going to be donated to different friends and family members of mine. And it's going to be spread out around the country so people can watch it. It's not to make money. I want people to simply know about what's really going on. What's worse than suffering is suffering and people suffering. You guys want a couple more pictures? You want to ask questions? I'll do that.
So in that conclusion, I would just want to make sure, just stay tuned, we're going to have more programs. And I am humbly uh, joined uh, the BDS group. And uh, we are working on the BDS group, so sign up with that. That's another effort, so please join that. And thank you very much. And if anybody want to ask about uh, our Coca-Cola product, we have that in our website, but also in the Facebook and the anti war have that in the website. Thank you.
Um, so, we are going to actually be having a fundraiser for the Sumia Oda on February 21st. Write it down Saturday, February 21st. Oh, wow. Okay, February 21st at Intermediate Arts, 6 30 till 12. We're going to be having all the flyers around your chairs, so that's more info. We're going to be having a silent auction, activities, we're going to be having letter writing to the Sumia and other political prisoners. There's going to be free penna, great food, and lots of activities going on. And we're going to have poetry. We're actually going to have Miss Mia Ode talking herself via Skype for 15 minutes. And then we're going to have the oh, films curated by Nizza. And then we're having live music and drop Miss Mia at the end of the night. And that includes uh, artists that are all politically uh, motivated, like Ida Prague, Manifesto, Zero Perspective. Paul Paul and Oliver Quincy. And yeah, we're having a I forgot, live option with amazing art from Twin Cities artists and a lot of kids from actually Southwest High School are making art specifically for this show and all that money is going to be going for this arena. So yeah, everything should come. So the first is that tomorrow at 1 p.m., Wayon is hosting an event, Changing Perspectives Out Israel and Palestine, a Sky to event with the story in Milan Cafe, which I think I saw some flyers. They didn't get on your okay, did they go around? Okay, so you got them, so you already know. The next one is um, next week is a national week of action to demand justice for us meet up. There's two things you can do, both of them on Friday. It's like Friday is Rasmia Day in Minneapolis. At 4.30 at Snelling and Summit, there is a weekly vigil for Palestine. And next week vigil is going to be focused on demanding justice for Rasmia. That's organized, I think, by folks from the Land Middle East Committee. There are certainly the people who are among those who are there. Um, but those, no one's like making any nodding, so I can't answer any questions that I don't think there's a fire. But then following that, we're going to have part of a national live stream broadcast. It's me and I'm be speaking live uh, at 4200 Cedar Avenue. The event's going to start at 6 o'clock. We're going to have pizza, and we're going to get to hear directly from us Mia. Then, that's Friday, February 13th. On Saturday, which is Valentine's Day, uh, the Women's Prison Book Project is holding an annual pancake breakfast at 8, from 8 a.m. to noon at the newly rebuilt Walker United Methodist Church at 31st Street and 16th Avenue. And it happens at AWC, we love pancakes. So we're going to go have breakfast, and then anyone who would like to join us, either for breakfast or after, we're going to leave from Walker at noon to go postering to get the word out, one last big push around Rock Service Mia. Then the last thing I wanted to announce is a little further out. I'm going to keep you really busy the next two weeks, and then I have nothing else for you that I'm going to make you go to until Saturday, March 21st, which is a Stop U.S. Wars protest. It will begin at 1 p.m. at Lake Street in Hiawatha, and then a march to Walker Community Church. And that's sponsored by the Minnesota Peace Action Coalition. Um, and I think those are all the details. And you had an announcement, too. This is Julia Schwartz, the Break the Bonds. Much louder! Sonia Schwartz from Minnesota Break the Bonds campaign. There were two uh, uh, clipboards that went around. Um, I think Sarah picked up one of them. Uh, it's a petition. We want, we're trying to get we're trying to get Minnesota to divest from the Israel bonds that it holds. One of the bonds is maturing in June, and so what, now what we're asking is that that Minnesota not reinvest in those Israel bonds. And so. Did everybody have a chance to uh, sign the petition? Who did that? Yeah, okay. And does anybody, can anybody volunteer to get more signatures? We're trying to get 10,000 signatures by the end of the month. Is that a classroom or a church community or other faith community you can take it to? Your union meeting? Is it guys here? Should they see you before they leave um, to get a blank one, or what should they do? Yeah, you can do that. And uh, yeah, for everybody else, you can encourage people to go online, uh, minnesotamn.breakthebonds.org, and the petition is there to you. 
All right, so now back to Sabria. Yeah. What we want to do is take questions. Maybe Sabri wants to show a few more pictures too. Um, and then I think he maybe mentioned there is some video, but we don't have speakers. So we're doing that kind of end to end if people want to stick around. But it won't be as loud as I had Sabri. It's up to you. Sabri's in charge now. What else? A few more pictures? Okay. There are some questions. Do you want to shut off the lights right now? Sophia, can you use the lights? This is Ines Khalil. She's only four years old on October 19, 2014. Three and a half months ago, her and her friend, Tulin Askumun, were just dropped off the bus waiting for the mom to cross the street to walk them back to the house. When suddenly, a settler, an Israeli settler, came speeding and rammed them both with his car sending them both flying about 100 feet in the air with their moms just, I mean, this happened right in front of their mom's eyes. And as Khalil didn't make it, she died instantly. Tulin Asfour, which I'll show you a picture of soon, her friend survived, but look how she survived. Imagine how hard it was for me to do the interview with her mom at the hospital. She cannot walk. She lost her speech. She has no function of her brain. She looks to me like she's dazed. She lost functions of her body. Israel got a hold of this guy. He fled. The guy said, I was drunk. It was an accident. I didn't mean it. Let's say, hypothetically, he did it purposely do it. And keep in mind, it was done during a three-week stretch where several settlers intentionally hit Palestinians and fled. It was done during that time. It wasn't like random. That's how you know he like purposely did it. But let's just say, hypothetically, it was an accident. He was drunk, he hit two girls, but he still fled. So, like in the scene in the movie, Time to Kill, when Matthew McConaughey looks at the jury, and he tells him, imagine, now his dead child is white. So I'm asking you, imagine if it was your child, okay? And you found out somebody hit your four-year-old, and he fled. And one of them died, and say your friend's child survived, he can't walk, he had, uh, no function of the brain, uh, Still in the hospital, by the way. Believe the one survived, still in the hospital. Nothing happened to him. Israel says he says an accident, nothing happened to him. He's free. How would you feel? But if a Palestinian did anything like that, his home is demolished. He's, he's tortured in prison. And if they find out it is an accident, worst case scenario, that at least continues in prison. So this guy is free while one child is dead. Now you can see she ain't a terrorist. But she doesn't have hopes of a terrorist, as Fox News always tries to make out Palestinians. She has dreams just like American children. She loves SpongeBob. SpongeBob, by the way, is big even in Palestine. It's big everywhere. She loves SpongeBob. She loves a, a butterfly. She loves Tweety. She loves uh, Hello Kitty. This is her favorite duck dress. Does that look like uh, a child that's dreaming of growing up to be a terrorist? Or does that look like a child that wants to just have a life? See, you don't see this on Fox News. I'm going to show it to you. That was it. You'll never see this on Fox News. Just like a long time ago, they never showed, they never showed the African Americans or the Native Americans as human beings. That's what's happening now with us. They always show it like we're savages. They don't show you the real truth. People just like anybody else. Why? Why should? Because they're worried that you might have a heart and then seek out the truth and see what Israel is really about. This is Ines Khalil's sister and brother. Um, the one on the right is for that. She is 10. She said her uh, role is to grow up and be a lawyer to defend the Palestinians against Israel's racism laws. And her brother Muhammad on the left is eight years old and his dream is to simply just one day live without being under occupation. And it was sad when I brought them both over to me while I was filming, and I asked for that, and you miss your sister, and tears come out of her eyes, and I say, what do you want? She says she just wants the Palestinian people to just let people know that they're living under occupation, 
and know that they're people just like everybody else, and they want a voice to be heard up. And I promise her every time I visit Palestine, I'm going to bring her and her brother gifts, and from now on, we will be treated as if my own gifts are the way I want. We're just we're regular kids, just like you guys. This is, and if you look, please stare at her eyes. This is Torina Spur, the girl who survived the attack by the Saturday. She survived. She has no brain function. She can't walk. She's still in the hospital. She's only five years old. She, 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 she did it. She did it. She did it. She's simply waiting for mom to cross the street to get that girl. And suddenly, bam, a settler just comes in and hits her and her friend and sends them 100 feet. And her parents told me they don't want nothing to happen to us. So they don't want nothing to punish me versus the Jews. They simply want what like anybody else wants. That guy who committed the crime to be punished. That's all they want. That's all they want. The majority of Palestinians and the majority of Israelis live together. But Israel has a system in place to make life all the Palestinians. And they purposely take the racist settlers and put them in the middle of towns in the West Bank to make their life even harder. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. How would you like it if you purposely had the government take members of the KKK and brought it and put it in a very uh, progressive, very liberal area to, to make their lives living hell. And you see the KKK have special access to go and talk on the road, but you can't. You see the KKK have special entrances to go in the buildings, but you can't. You say, I mean, how do you feel if that happens? How do you feel? That's, that's what life is like over there. That's why they fear the camera. They fear the camera. I mean, they hate the camera in Israel. If the soldier sees a camera, he screams the top of his lungs, close the camera. So if, you have, if you're a democracy, like they say they are, why are they scared of the camera? They fear the camera more than anything else in Israel. Yeah, that's the one. This is Atala Hanna. He's a prominent public figure worldwide for Christians. This guy right here, when I asked him, how do you feel knowing you're not only Christian, you're a public figure, and you're one of the leaders of Christian. He's one of the leaders of the homeless church in all Christianity. So don't believe anything I'm saying. I, 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 I promise you, I don't have hypnotic powers. I did not hypnotize him into what he's saying. At home, how do you feel knowing in America they can be able to protect Christians? And then he's like, that's, that's just absolutely the second class thing. It's a lot of our land. It may cause go to the process of trying to do whatever they can to strip our citizenships. And then I asked them, well, how do you feel like about the myth in America if Israel's gone, uh, the Muslims uh, attack the Christians? He started laughing. He's like, there is no difference between the Christians and the Muslims. We're all one. There was never, ever any problem between Christians and Muslims. Since the time of hundreds of years ago, never any problem between them. So you have to ask yourself, that's the case, then why the lies in America? Why the American media going on the way to lie? Well, it's really simple. Christian Zionists believe, and, and I told him about that, and he knows about it. Just like there's a lot of sects of people in Muslim, there's a lot of sects, different sects of Christianity. People like Pat Robertson and many Christian Zionists believe, in order for Jesus Christ to come back, and I'm not making any of this up, this is serious, they believe that in order for Jesus Christ to come back, they are willing to sacrifice their own Christians living in the Holy Land. Pat Robertson believes this. The Muslims and Christians must all be kicked out of the Holy Land. The Jews worldwide have to all migrate to Israel. So Jesus Christ will come back. They give the Jews a choice. Those who convert to Christianity, convert to Christianity are saved. Those who don't, he's going to go ahead and have them killed. And then... The end of times come. I'm not making this up. Some of you guys think probably funny. Pat Robertson and a lot of Christians believe this. So to Israel, they think, hey, Pat Robertson believes this, and we know that we have the last lab. If he wants to help us and keep doing this, that's fine. 
But I asked them, how do you feel about the Christmas year? The Lord has sacrificed you. You've lived here since the times of Jesus Christ himself. If you're, protect, if you're protecting Christianity, you're protecting the Holy Land. You'll see mosques in between churches in Bethlehem. The myth about Muslims attack Christians. Well, that's funny because you're going to see in the documentary uh, Omar ibn Khattab Mosque right in the middle of Bethlehem, surrounded by churches. The holiest church for Christianity, the Church of Nativity. You'll hear from Christians talking about how the wall was taken, the, uh, built right on their land, their land stolen. If they protect Christianity, why is it an apartheid wall? Literally cutting through Bethlehem, taking a lot of Palestinian land, Christians taking the land, giving it to settlers. How do you feel if I came and I said, hey, I'm taking your home, I'll give you the deal. You said, I don't want to sell my home. I put a gun to it and I said, go, you either sell your home or I'm going to shoot you and take your home. How do you feel? Ask yourself that question. Who gives Israel right to either take the Palestinian land by force, they either give them to I buy it, and if they don't want to sell it, they take it by force. Does that sound like democracy to you? And always, when we bring up Israel, uh, look at Saudi Arabia, look at Jordan. Look at... We know Saudi Arabia is a racist government. We know Jordan's a racist government. We know a lot of these countries' government. But if I live in the neighborhood, you don't look good if you kidnap children, and your excuse is, yeah, I kidnapped them, but this guy is a molester. That's a stupid argument. You're supposed to go ahead and change your ways, and then the other governments, we keep condemning them until they change their ways. You can't keep saying you, you're doing this because the other ones are Australian. That doesn't make any sense. That's, that's where I just... Yeah, you guys have questions on that. Can I have the lights again? Thank you, Steph. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, Thanks for coming. Thank you. 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 I completely respect your commitment to nonviolence, but given that the Israeli government in the past has been really resistant to any form of nonviolent opposition, especially from Palestinians, and has sort of ignored that, um, first part, is it really fair to respect people in the community to do what they were under direct violence attack from the Israeli government to impute nonviolence? And if it is fair, Second part, what alternative methods could you suggest to them since the non-violent, traditional non-violent methods are often just simply ignored by the Israeli government, even when they get covered by media from on the rare occasions when they get covered by media. So it doesn't seem to change. Well, that's first of all a great question. There's a documentary, first Palestinian ever to make it to the Oscars. The Palestinians raise their hand real quick. Any Palestinian here? Okay, this man, Imad Burnett, made it to the Oscars just a couple years ago, okay? His documentary called Five Broken Camels. If you haven't watched it, please watch it. Like I said before, don't take one word I'm saying for truth, okay? I'll always give you resources to check yourself. The whole documentary is about Palestinians who are activists from abroad, Europe, and America. So Non-violently protesting the checkpoints and the wall that they just came into Tanakhali. It's about Tanakhali. The whole documentary is about a small.